Welcome to this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. My name is Daniel Murphy, and I am assistant editor of the journal. If you are new to these podcasts, please visit the Florida Historical Quarterly on Facebook, where you can now access abstracts of each article in the current issue of the journal. Today's podcast features an interview with Dr. Paul Hoffman, Murrell Professor of History at Louisiana State University. Dr. Hoffman served as guest editor of the winter 2013 issue of the Florida Historical Quarterly, titled 500 Years of Florida History, the 16th Century. This issue is part of a series of special issues that will be published in recognition of the quincentennial of Ponce de Leon's first visit to Florida in 1513. These special issues will examine Florida over the previous five centuries. Beginning in 2013, a special issue will be published each consecutive year, with two in 2016, that provides an overview of current interpretations and evaluation of historiographic trends relevant to the period being covered. In today's interview, Dr. Hoffman and I discuss the special issue on 16th century Florida and the topic's relevance in the 21st century. I asked Dr. Hoffman to tell me a little bit about himself. I'm Paul Hoffman. I'm professor of history at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. Uh, I got my Ph.D. from the University of Florida in Gainesville. I've been trained in Latin American colonial history uh, and have written fairly extensively about Spanish Florida. I have two books on that subject, one of which is called A New Andalusia and A Way to the Orient, which explores the uh, ideas about the land that arose mostly in the 1520s and then got people excited about settling on the coast of the Carolinas, as we would call them, uh, but also in Florida. Uh, And then another one called Florida's Frontiers, which takes the story of Florida, uh, La Florida, as the Spaniards called it originally, which is roughly Virginia to Florida, and then to some really vague point on the Gulf Coast to the west, uh, and explores the history of that and how Spanish La Florida gradually retreated to become just the state of Florida as we know it today. And that particular study, uh, because of what was asked by the editors, actually goes to 1860, so it's a 1512 or 11 or so to 1860, one volume compressed history of um, Spanish Florida. Uh, And I've done some other things related to Spanish Louisiana, and my real interest is in the Spanish Caribbean, uh, which was the subject of my first book, uh, and to which I hope eventually to return. Uh, Can you briefly describe your vision for the special issue on 16th century Florida? Yes. uh, I was asked to be the uh, editor of the special edition and to write an essay on the historical literature covering the 16th century, uh, which I've done. But then I thought, well, the historical literature, as I've practiced that genre, can really only be done well if you know something about the the archaeology of the time, uh, particularly Native Americans. That's how we know a lot about them but also the Spaniards. And so I uh, went to um, the best person on that and got got her to agree to write an essay. And then I thought, well, it would be nice if I could get a couple of other essays for the special issue uh, by younger scholars who might be taking different perspectives on the history of the 16th century or some piece of it uh, than has been traditional. Okay. Well, um, who are the contributors and what is their focus? Uh, aside from myself, uh, the archaeology is by Dr. Kathleen Deegan, who is Emeritus Professor of the Museum of Natural History at the University of Florida, uh, and is very well known, I think, for her work on St. Augustine, but also for her work on early Spanish sites in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Uh, so she's put together a very fine essay that looks at not just uh, Spanish colonial uh, archaeology, which is her particular specialty, but at my request, she also uh, brings together information about the current state of the study of the various Native peoples, Native American peoples that the Spaniards encountered uh, in the Southeast during the 16th century. Then the the next essay, that I'm not sure what order they're actually in in the journal, but uh, is by Dr. John McGrath of Boston University, uh, who contributed an excellent little study on how legends and myths uh, of Florida's potential, uh, potential riches, that is, 
distorted the designs of European explorers, would-be settlers, and became woven into maps, cosmographies, and histories during the 16th century, uh, trying to uh, understand sort of the imagery that people had when they came to Florida, what they thought they were going to find, uh, as of course opposed to what they did find, <clears throat> and, and, and the role that those ideas played in exploration and other things. Uh, the fourth essay <clears throat> is by Dr. Jonathan DeCoster, uh, who just finished a PhD at Brandeis University. His essay examines the French and Spanish accounts of their interactions with the Timucua Indians in the lower St. John's River Valley uh, between 1564 and about 1570. This is the area which today we'd identify as Jacksonville. Jacksonville area, but it's a little more extensive than that. Uh, and he finds that both groups of Europeans fell into existing Timucuan rivalries, politics, uh, warfare, and really didn't understand what what was happening. Uh, in effect, the, the Timucua, particularly Cacique Santariwa, who was the most important cacique apparently in the lower St. John's Valley, uh, he manipulated the French and the Spaniards uh, for his own own ends and for the ends of – and other Tamuka groups did the same thing. So Europeans at the time, and most historians who have used their accounts up until now, have thought, well, Europeans were in control. But in fact, what the Coster shows is that they were not in control. They were being controlled. So this is a very new and different perspective on the role of Europeans and the conquistadors, shall we say, uh, in their relationship with Native Americans. So I think it's a, a really useful new perspective, and I'm very glad that Jonathan was, was willing to, to put it into the issue for me. Okay. Well, uh, based on these works, and, and just or maybe just in general as far as the uh, 16th century uh, history is concerned, are there any specific events or movements or peoples in 16th century Florida that stand out for their regional or wider impact? Uh, well, <clears throat> we'll begin with Juan Ponce de Leon and his explorations in 1513. Uh, he literally <clears throat> put Florida on the map uh, in its approximately correct relationship to Cuba. And even though the map in question, which is the uh, Fraducci map, uh, doesn't show all of Florida, it shows a major piece of the East Coast and some of the West Coast, so such that you know we could say, oh, yeah, they – in effect, they're showing a peninsula, uh, although it's not connected to anything. Uh, and that's a really important thing because there, there's some earlier maps that people think show Florida, but not in its correct relationship to Cuba. Uh, and really the earliest map that clearly does relate to Florida is a map from 1511 uh, called the Peter Martyr map, which shows something called Bimini, which as we know, Ponce was looking for. Uh, there's an east-west landmass north, land north of Cuba, uh, but without the peninsula. So between that map and, and the uh, Ferducci map, which is probably 1515, nobody's quite sure because it's not dated, uh, you know, there's, there's a change in our understanding. And then after Ponce, after the Ferducci map, Spanish maps and all other maps derived from them begin to show Florida as a peninsula. Uh, so that's obviously extraordinarily important. And because they show Florida as connected to the North American continent, uh, you know, it, be, it began by, by say, let's, let's say by 15, certainly by 1526, uh, the Spaniards knew roughly the size and shape of North America and where Florida fit on that continent relative to Cuba, the Bahamas, uh, of course, the Gulf of Mexico, and so forth. So uh, Ponce's early explorations are really fundamentally important for, for understanding the, the region and, indeed, all of North America and the Americas. Uh, the next on my list would be Hernando de Soto's expedition. Uh, it is clearly of great regional significance. <clears throat> he wandered not only from Tampa Bay northward to the area that's now Tallahassee and had its winter camp there, which has been excavated, but went up uh, north of there, basically following the fall line, um, where places like Augusta, Georgia are today, uh, 
uh, Columbia, South Carolina, following the fall line from going, working from Native American polity to Native American polity. When he got up into the area we call North Carolina, he swung west across the mountains uh, looking for gold and silver, which he never found, uh, and then eventually came down into central Alabama, uh, and then from central Alabama took a, a kind of a loop uh, up to the northwest to where he crossed the Mississippi. Most people think either extreme northwest Mississippi or southwest uh, Tennessee, went over into Arkansas, uh, mucked around in Arkansas for a while, eventually died. His surviving members of his expedition said, well, we must be close we must be close to Mexico because we've crossed a great river, which they identified as the River of the Holy Spirit. Uh, <clears throat> and from other sources, it is clear that the River of the Holy Spirit is supposed to be the dividing line between Florida, as De Soto had it, Florida to the east and Mexico or New Spain to the west. So technically, when they crossed the river, they had crossed over into an area that was not part of De Soto's area for exploration. Uh, and that, I think, is the explanation of why they then head southwest into what, in fact, is Texas, uh, thinking, well, we must be close to northern Mexico and areas of Spanish settlement. Of course, they didn't find Spanish settlement. They became discouraged when they got out into East Texas, uh, turned around and went back to Arkansas, built the boats that they used then to go down the Mississippi River uh, and out into the Gulf of Mexico, and so by probably along the coast until they finally did reach the real Mexico and Mexican settlements. Uh, so De Soto's expedition you know, covers the whole area, and from the accounts that we have, in which there are four, and fragments of a fifth, uh, we know a lot about Native American society in that period uh, and where the people were and the size of the, the communities and so forth. And that's a snapshot which is invaluable because um, – 150 years later or 200 years later when the English begin to seriously go into the same areas for trade and ultimately for settlement, uh, the Native American peoples that they encounter are the same people in some cases but not in the same place and not nearly as numerous. So there's a kind of a century or a half that just disappears. Uh, and DeSoto gives us a beginning point and then the English accounts and some Spanish accounts from the 18th century give us an end point and in between we see what happened. Um, but it's a very important because DeSoto's people also, when they were tramp tramping around through the southeast, they were looking for gold and silver and that sort of thing, which they didn't find, but they also paid attention to the agricultural potential and identified a number of places where the soils seemed to support large Native American populations and where they thought that might be suitable uh, for Spanish exploration uh, further exploration, and then Spanish settlement. And some of that information uh, gets filtered into the Tristan de Luna expedition in 1559 to 1560, and it also gets uh, used when a man named Juan Pardo uh, went north and west from uh, Spanish Santa Elena, which is on Paris Island, South Carolina, uh, in 1566 through 1568, uh, exploring, looking for resources and uh, what we might call the back country, it's really the Piedmont and the foothills of the Appalachian, Appalachian, uh, Appalachian Mountains. Um, so, you know, DeSoto has reverberations, you know, down the road, down down through the 16th century, and some people would argue much later than that because there's a, an ongoing debate about whether he and the people with him uh, brought various kinds of diseases uh, to Native Americans to which they had very little immunity and consequently caused the die-off. Uh, I'm personally not of that opinion, but uh, it's certainly out there. Uh, there's also the issue of DeSoto's pigs, whether they became the ancestors of feral hogs throughout the southeast. Uh, that one I'll, I'll leave for the, the geneticists to try to figure out. I, I have no opinion on that. But anyway, the next thing on my list of, of important things is, is, of course, Pedro Mendez de Aviles' settlement at St. Augustine in 1565 and then at Santa Elena uh, in 1566. Uh, in both cases, he's really trying to move into an area where the French had been present. In St. Augustine, of course, he picked a harbor that was south of uh, Fort Caroline, which was on the lower St. John's River, uh, from which he could strike at that fort uh, without having the, the difficulties of crossing the bar on the St. John's River and trying to land men 
uh, in the face of what probably would have been hostile fire. Uh, in the case of Santa Elena, he knew that the French had been there under Jean Rabot uh, in 1562-63, and in fact, uh, the first Spanish fort there, we now know, was actually built right on top of the remains of what the French had had. It was kind of a fortified longhouse with a little bit of a mo dry moat around it, uh, just to protect themselves both from Native Americans and in the event that the Spaniards had shown up uh, to challenge their presence. So those are the two settlements he, he set up that endured for any time. Santa Elena was abandoned in 1587. But I think the real significance of what Menendez does, aside from, again, creating uh, a permanent European presence in the South and in Florida, uh, is that this is, the, this is the beginning of sustained contact between Native Americans and Europeans, and the beginning, therefore, of the integration of uh, Native Americans in the South into the Atlantic economy, uh, and a gradual development, which really accelerates in the 18th century, uh, of, the, of their dependence on European manufactured goods, uh, particularly metal objects initially, but then eventually cloth and, and other kinds of goods that they simply couldn't couldn't produce or didn't produce uh, <coughs> out of the resources. <coughs> excuse me, of the uh, of, of the South. So I think you know again Menendez colony from the 16th century has reverberations you know down to the down to the present uh, because the city of St Augustine in its current location probably dates from 1572 uh, and that's what 30 almost yeah 30 some years uh, before Jamestown and about 40 some before Plymouth plantation so it is the oldest continuously occupied uh, town in North America. <clears throat> so those are those, those are the three things I would I would point to uh, as being extremely extremely important from the 16th century. Hmm. Well, you, you've you've kind of already touched on it, but I, I think it's worth asking again. Uh, students often ask me, as you know, okay, so I know the details, but what what are the legacies of 16th century Florida? Why should I care about 16th century Florida today? And I, I try to give them answers, but I don't know if they're always satisfied. Based on your studies, your research, what are the enduring legacies of 16th century Florida, and how should we regard the region and period today? Well, there are a couple of enduring legacies which are kind of obvious, but maybe not, some people would say not terribly profound, uh, but I think they are. One, of course, is, is our place names. I mean, the very name Florida is a name that was bestowed in the 16th century. Uh, St. Augustine is a 16th century name. Pensacola is an 18th century name. Uh, and there are a few others. I think Boca Raton may be a 16th century name. Uh, and there are Native American names which are spelled in the way that the Spaniards spelled them, not the way the Native Americans pronounced them, but the way the Spaniards thought they did, um, that you know come down. So we have a lot of toponyms, place names, uh, that, are, that are part of the enduring legacy of the 16th century. Uh, there's also some physical things I would point to, and, what, and one of them is the layout of St. Augustine itself. Uh, the, from, if you take the, from the plaza south to Bridge Street and from the Bayfront back to St. George Street, uh, those in there, if you've ever been there, you know that there's a very small blocks compared to the blocks north and south of the plaza, which tend to be rather long and skinny. Uh, those little blocks are, so far as we've been able to determine, the 16th century city. It was laid out that way about 1572. Uh, the present plaza is a little bit later in date, the 1590s. Uh, <clears throat> but but that core of St. Augustine has endured. Uh, and you know, for people who live there, it's obviously very important. Uh, orange trees and some other flora that the Spaniards brought in. Uh, we know that, the, that they were planting orange trees in St. Augustine, and we know that the uh, Native Americans liked the fruit, and they took it, and there's the seeds from orange trees uh, sprouted and grew along the St. John's so that when, for example, some of the English come in in the 18th century after the English get Florida in 1763, uh, they were astounded to discover groves of wild orange trees uh, just growing along the St. John's River and in a few other places as well. So uh, the orange tree is, in, is in enduring further north uh, where they will grow. Uh, the peaches, the peach also, peach tree, uh, 
was introduced by Spaniards and again spread by Native Americans well beyond the area of any Spanish, direct Spanish contact. And again, the Englishmen coming in much later say, oh gosh, where did these come from? We didn't know these were Native because they're not Native. They came in with Europeans. And I think the watermelon, and, and again, there are probably a number of other things like that that have been introduced, and probably a lot of weeds and, and other grasses and things of that sort that I'm not enough of a botanist to be able to tell you about, uh, that, that came in. So those are enduring legacies. Some people, again, might say, well, okay, so what? Uh, but, but they are important. Uh, it is also the case that you have a number of interesting characters, Ponce de Leon, De Soto, Menendez de Avales, uh, Juan Pardo, who was the man that went from Santa Elena up into the interior. Uh, there are some Native American women that we know by name, we don't know much about them, who were who came out of the interior, out of the, the uh, basically the Piedmont or the, perhaps the, the foothills of the, of the Appalachians uh, when Pardo's people were withdrawn in 1768. Well, they were both withdrawn and chased out by their by their Indian neighbors who'd had enough of them. Uh, so there, that's, there's that sort of thing. There, there are a lot of other people who, uh, frankly, are better known only to historians uh, and certainly are not household words, but those, those I would point to. One of the issues that comes up uh, about European contact in the 16th century particularly is whether it, it is the period when the uh, demographic disaster, as it's called elsewhere in the Americas, begins to hit Native Americans in North America. That is the introduction of old world diseases like smallpox uh, and probably variations on the flu and some other things that, uh, and measles, mumps, uh, diseases that, that Native Americans had no real immunity to because they had not experienced the same Neolithic revolution uh, that people in the old world had. That is the, the transition into farming and the use of domesticated animals like the pig and the cow um, and chickens and things of that sort. So, And a lot of the viral diseases we have, like smallpox, uh, are diseases that, are, that, that live in those animals or can live in those animals and then ju have jumped to humans, They're very much like the concern in recent years about you know, avian bird flu that might, might mutate in such a way that it would jump to humans very much like it did in 1918, the great pandemic of that year. Uh, but something like that happened in the Old World at the time that Old World peoples began to farm in the Fertile Crescent and then in, in various parts of Africa. And so people from the Old World had some immunity, either because they'd been exposed as children and had survived, or because just you know a group of people after a while does get some some immunity. Now the problem, of course, is that those viruses can mutate and become virulent, uh, and then at other times mutate and not be virulent. But but Europeans and Africans, as a group, had you know a degree of immunity. It, it was you could get the disease, you could die from it, but the death rate in the in the old world is not nearly as high as it was in the new world. In parts of the new world, some of these epidemics carried out carried off 90% of the people who first contracted the disease, and smallpox particularly was deadly. Um, so one of the arguments is, well, European contact, which in the case of the southeast really begins with Ponce de Leon, uh, must have introduced these diseases, and, and a number of people have said, well, it's really De Soto that did that because he was present for so long, he had all these people with him, and pigs and so forth, and so it must have, that must be the beginning. Um, if that is true, then that's a major legacy because it had the effect of reducing a fairly substantial population of Native Americans. I mean, their populations were were fairly dense in small places, uh, but they were not widely spread across the South the way settlement is today uh, with the same densities that we have today. But they were present, and they certainly contested uh, and, and challenged and, and, and resisted the Spanish presence around Santa Elena and even around St. Augustine until the Spanish beat up on them uh, and destroyed enough of their crops and killed enough of them that, that they basically, we get the picture. You guys are in charge and we're not going to buck you anymore. Uh, but but throughout, the, throughout the colonial period, and certainly in the 16th century, uh, the Spaniards had to be aware of the fact that, that they had moved into an area where there were some uh, people who were quite capable of uh, overthrowing them uh, if they chose to do so. Uh, so the question then, you know, you know, did did 
did the diseases that Europeans brought, uh, unintentionally begin to decimate this plant? Uh, my personal view is the answer is no. It comes in the 17th century. And the reason that I say smallpox and their viral diseases don't have very long lifespans. And most adults who crossed the Atlantic had been immune and were not likely to be carriers diseases, and consequently they couldn't have spread them to, to Native Americans. But when you begin to get children coming across the Atlantic, pilgrims, but the kids will say they transmit something like smallpox or the mumps or whatever, you know, one to the other, and there's just enough vulnerability to these diseases, and, and the, you know, if you have a family of them, easily get the disease from England to New England. And once it gets to New England, then it can spread quite rapidly because people, of course, had very little knowledge of why and how diseases spread, uh, and so you know, they can quite readily begin to infect other people. And then once that starts, uh, because of all the trade networks that existed among Native Americans and also the fact they occasionally went to war with each other, uh, you have a lot of contact, or enough contact apparently, that you can then begin to transmit these diseases uh, and they begin to show up. Now, in the 17, 1620s, uh, we know that the missions of central Florida and on the Georgia coast were devastated by the outbreak of various diseases. We're not quite sure what they were. Uh, and, you know, populations reduced by 50, 60, 70 percent in some cases uh, to the point where the missionaries said, well, we've got to take villages that have been independent and consolidate them in, around the central mission village. None of that's going on in the 16th century which is a pretty good indication that as yet diseases hadn't arrived. But as I say, there is, there is that alternative argument that's out there, uh, particularly with respect to DeSoto. So that's important in terms of sort of clearing the land uh, uh, so that when Europeans begin to seriously move off the coast and move into the interior of the southeast, uh, they find old fields, which they can readily convert to farming, but they don't find a lot of Native Americans who are going to say, wait a minute, you can't come in here, this is our territory, and we're, we're strong enough that we can resist your, your advances. That's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> well, it's a great answer, and actually that's the one I will give my students the next, next time they ask me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for joining our international audience for this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. The Florida Historical Quarterly is the peer-reviewed scholarly journal of the Florida Historical Society. The Society was founded in 1856 and is the only statewide historical organization in the state of Florida. The Society is headquartered in Cocoa, Florida, and the editorial offices of the journal are in the Department of History at the University of Central Florida. I hope you have enjoyed the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast and that you will consider supporting future scholarship on Florida history by becoming a member of the Florida Historical Society. We look forward to receiving your feedback on the issue addressed in this podcast and on future FHQ publications as well. We also invite researchers to access back issues of the Florida Historical Quarterly on JSTOR. Thank you again for listening to the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast. If you enjoyed listening to this interview and know of others who enjoy history, please tell them about the podcast and have them find us on Facebook.